been built around the world, not one was ever built the way you're about to see. When Virginia replaced the George P. Coleman Bridge that connects historic Yorktown and Gloucester Point, engineering, innovation, and imagination were blended in a recipe that produced a unique product in record time. For the first time ever, an entire bridge, complete with its own paved roadway, barrier walls, light poles, and bridge tender's house, was built in one place and installed in another, ready to carry traffic. The six sections of the bridge were built in Norfolk, then floated to the site on the York River, where they would be connected into a single unit, forming the largest double swing span bridge in the world. In and of itself, there's nothing new about the float-in technique. It's been used numerous times, but only to move the steelwork into place. In fact, back in 1952, when the original Coleman Bridge was built, its steelwork was also floated into place. And once it was in place, it was still months before traffic could use it because the roadway still had to be built. And that's where our story of 1996 differs greatly from the one of 1952. The float-in concept was essentially the same. It was what was floated in that made all the difference. And the difference was a big one. It meant that motorists waited only nine days to use the new bridge. And saving time was one of the most important elements of this entire project. This technique was devised by the engineering firm of Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Quaid, and Douglas. And this innovative approach replaced an earlier alternative plan that called for a temporary floating bridge to carry traffic while the old bridge was replaced. But that plan would have taken more time and cost more money. Citizens and elected officials were very pleased with the float-in technique because, in addition to being faster, it reduced construction costs by $15 million. And that meant tolls for the new bridge would be less than earlier anticipated. And even though the plan was a good one, it was not without its drawbacks. Since the new superstructure was placed on the same concrete piers that supported the old bridge, the 30,000 motorists who used the bridge daily had to be detoured 75 miles through the town of West Point. The original plans for the change from the old bridge to the new one called for the construction period and thus the detour to last for two 12-day periods. However, Tidewater Construction Corporation, the prime contractor, was promised bonus money if the job could be finished early. That motivation resulted in the work being done in just nine days. That was quite a difference. Detouring traffic for one nine-day period as opposed to two 12-day periods cut the inconvenience by nearly two-thirds. Of course, it took a lot longer than nine days to build the bridge and construction at the bridge site on Route 17 began in January 1994 with the widening of the approach roadways and the bridge piers. While the work at the bridge site itself was anything but inconsequential, it paled in comparison with what was being done 35 miles downriver at the Norfolk International Terminal. Back at the crossing site, the first step was to widen the concrete piers that would hold the new bridge. While this was taking place at the old structure, downriver fabricated steel beams were put together piece by piece to form the new four-lane structure. The first piece of steel was put in place in the fall of 1994 and the last installed in late 1995. That done, work began on the bridge's concrete driving surface. By March of 1996, the new crossing was ready to be put in place. Now we're ready to take a look at the amazing process of replacing an old two-lane bridge with a new one, more than twice as wide. The bridge was broken down into six individual pieces that would form two identical halves that would meet in the middle of the river. Each half included a 500-foot swing span, a 560-foot anchor span, and a 210-foot suspended span. 
The first step was to float the three new pieces of the Yorktown half of the bridge, shown here on the right. But before these giant structures could be moved, they had to be lifted. And how was something this heavy lifted? Well, instead of cranes or hydraulic jacks, the process involved buoyancy. Barges filled with water and equipped with special braces were floated under the structure and lined up with special connection plates on the bridge itself. Once secured to the bridge, the water was pumped out of the barges, raising both the barge and the bridge section. Pumping water into the barges had the opposite effect, and that is how the new sections were lowered into place when they reached the bridge site. The first segment, weighing two and a half million pounds and measuring 210 feet in length, began its trip out of Norfolk International Terminal on April 3rd. In exactly one month from this date, the old bridge would be shut down and the process of putting the new bridge in place would begin. Once clear of the piers, tugboats pushed the span from the terminal over the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, up the Chesapeake Bay to the York River. The trip took about 10 hours. The U.S. Coast Guard coordinated marine traffic during the movement of the spans and enforced a safety zone while the bridge segments were under tow. Later, during the shutdown, the Coast Guard provided security at the bridge site, keeping boaters clear of the area. The 560-foot anchor span and the 500-foot swing span were moved just a few days before the shutdown. Here, the swing span floats over the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. Now the three sections that would replace the southern half of the bridge were on site, ready to be put in place. Route 17 would be closed, and the process of replacing the first half of the bridge would begin. VDOT crews worked through the night, uncovering the signs that would guide motorists on the West Point detour. By 5.30 in the morning of May 4th, the only thing left to do was move the barricades across the roadway at the bridge. Construction workers wasted no time getting started on pulling out the Yorktown half of the bridge. They began by moving the lifting barges into place under two of the three spans. Meanwhile, on the roadway deck, crews began disconnecting the spans, jackhammering concrete, cutting steel beams between sections and cutting cables that had carried power along the old bridge. By noon, just six hours after carrying its last car, the swing span was out. And with it, the bridge tender's house where swing operators had watched over the bridge since it opened in 1952. While the swing span was being removed with relative ease, Work on removing the shorter suspension span was presenting problems. It was not going to give up its place in Virginia's transportation history without a fight. 44 years of heavy traffic and corrosive salt air made it nearly impossible to remove the pins and the beams that tied the small piece to the adjacent spans. By the time the section was finally freed and ready to be pulled out, it was around 7 in the evening and the river was at low tide. So the move had to be postponed until later that night. However, while the return of the tide made the lifting process possible, pulling the section out was one of the big challenges in an operation that was, to say the very least, challenge-filled. Unlike the swing span, which had five feet of clearance on either end, this smaller section had only six inches of clearance and there were steel beams jutting out that wouldn't allow the piece to be pulled straight out. So the workers on the roadway had to relay instructions to the barge operators, resulting in moves that at times were no more than an inch. The task was tedious, comparable to getting a Cadillac out of a parallel parking space that was designed for a Volkswagen. But after hours of this inch-by-inch inch maneuvering, the segment was finally removed. Of course, not much maneuverability was needed to pull out the third piece. Since the sections on either side were already gone, the 560-foot anchor span came out easily. It was still Sunday, May 5th. The southern half of the Coleman Bridge had been removed in just 30 hours. 
The old bridge pieces were floated back down the river to Norfolk International Terminal. Here, the Yorktown half of the old bridge sits beside the Gloucester half of the new bridge. Since these bridge pieces could be moved as little as an inch in any direction, it's worth taking a look at how anchors, cables, pulleys, and power winches could be used to move something so large with such precision. First, the barges carrying the span were tied off to what was called a maneuvering barge. A power winch on top of the maneuvering barge was connected to cables running off each corner of the barge. These cables were attached to anchors in the riverbed. The operator used the winch to pull the barges and bridge sections, much like an elevator operates. With the old sections gone, work was begun immediately on replacing the southern half of the bridge. The new 210-foot section was moved into place, ready for installation. But first, the adjoining 560-foot anchor span was set on its piers. Then, the suspended span was lowered into place. Incidentally, each time a new section was set in place, the barges immediately were taken back down the river to bring up the corresponding section of the bridge for the northern half of the span. The installation of this section was completed by 8.30 Monday night, and it was just in time because foul weather was about to hit. 24 hours of heavy winds and rain brought things to a stop. It was Tuesday night before they could begin to move the new swing span into place. By 8.30 Wednesday morning, the swing span was in place. Half the bridge was done, but only a third of the allotted time had expired. Workers quickly moved their equipment to the Gloucester side and began removing the three old bridge sections that remained. By late afternoon on Thursday, May 9th, the three remaining sections of the old bridge were gone. The shutdown was now in its sixth day. The final phase began the next morning. By nighttime, Friday, May 10th, two of the three spans were set in place. The shutdown was not yet a week old, and only one piece of the new bridge was missing. The next day, Saturday, May the 11th, the 500-foot, 8-million-pound Gloucester side swing span was in place. The York River had been spanned with a new bridge, and the whole process had taken only seven and a half days. Now, only the finishing touches remain. Early Sunday morning, workers were placing concrete where the spans met, building barrier walls, and adding pavement markings the last things needed to make the bridge passable and safe for traffic. The job was done and the word spread quickly. By early Monday morning, people were already lining up to be among the first to cross the 1996 version of the George P. Coleman Bridge. And they didn't have to wait long. The first cars rolled across at 824, where just nine days before, the old Coleman Bridge had been standing and uh, work at Gloucester, but just heard the bridge was open on the way to work, and I turned around and said, I'm going to get in line and, and ride across just to see what the bridge is like. Bill Phelps and hundreds of others who made the trip across the new span liked what they saw. Not only did people like the finished product, they also liked what they saw during the shutdown. All during the nine-day bridge swap-out, spectators lined the beaches on both sides of the river. We haven't missed any days. We've come down here. Last night we stayed until 11.30. No, I've been, I'm in engineering. I've been in engineering, so I know they can do a lot of things, but uh, uh, the logistics of doing this within a short uh, period of time was just, you know, amazing. Paul Marriott's brother, Richard, had enough curiosity about the project to make the trip up from South Carolina. We planned just to come up here and see what was going on. He said there was a piece of history being made today with this bridge dropping in place, the first one in the world, so we thought we'd come up and see it. Oh, I had considerable concerns about whether it could be completed in this, in this real time frame that it's been done in. I figured it would take about twice as long. It is spectacular to sit here, to stand here and look at this and say they floated this out here in two, in two weeks. It's unbelievable. The new spans were a success.
Now attention turned again to the old bridge that had handled its traffic for more than four decades. The old sections had been floated back to Norfolk and placed on the piers that were used to build the new spans. In something of a precautionary move, the engineers had kept the old bridge intact until they were sure the new bridge was going to work correctly. And so, just two months after the new bridge was installed, the old bridge was history. However, amid the smoke and rubble of the remains of the old span, there were those who remembered that the old structure had been an engineering marvel in its own time and in its own right, especially the concrete piers that held up the bridge. They're still there, supporting the new one. Thomas Kiesel, an engineer with Parsons Brinkerhoff, was a design engineer on that original project. And the York River is very deep. It was 80 to 100 feet deep out in the middle. But more a problem was that the bottom was very soft. And so you would have to go down a very long way to get really hard foundation material to the extent that it would not have been economically feasible to build the bridge. And so for that reason, very special lightweight caissons were designed, which are steel shells that are largely hollow. Of course, when he says lightweight, he's talking in relative terms. These concrete pillars are extremely large structures, some of them 170 feet tall. In addition, the concrete piers that we see above the water level are considerably smaller than the steel and concrete caissons that extend 70 to 80 feet into the riverbed. Like the pieces of the new bridge, these caissons were built downriver and floated to the Yorktown site. Charles Kearns worked on the construction of the original bridge. Well, the caissons were being fabricated in the new shipyard, and we went down to, uh, after they, they got them, just before they got them ready to float them up the river, we had to pour, I think, about 250 yards of concrete in the base to keep them from turning over. And they were drawing uh, about 42 feet, and I understand it was about 43 feet in the channel at the York, Road, York Spit Light when they were at high tide. So we came in on high water with each one. They were bought up individually. And as Mr. Kearns points out, concrete had to be added to balance these large steel sleeves. And with all that weight, the obvious question is, how did they float? The caissons are called open dredge caisson, which means basically that it's divided into compartments, and some of the compartments were initially sealed off so that they held air and were buoyant, and the others were left open so that as you added weight to the caisson and sunk it into the bottom of the river, they were available for clamshells and dredging equipment to reach down through them and raise the material out from underneath. Once the caissons had been sunk to the river bottom, crews added steel walls atop the sleeves that rose above the river's surface. This provided an open shaft all the way down to the riverbed so the excavation could be done. Cranes mounted on barges lowered clam buckets to the bottom and scooped out the sand, one scoop at a time. Each scoop of sand that was removed increased the pressure on the bottom of the caisson, forcing it to settle deeper and deeper. The operation worked as intended, but it took a long time. It took a number of months, as much as six months, to get those down to a depth of 150 feet, of which there's 80 feet of water and 70 feet into the river bottom. And at that depth, there's enough embedment and enough lateral support from the sides that they're very stable, as has been proved by the service over the years. When the firm footing on the riverbed was finally reached, construction was begun on the concrete piers on top of the caissons. These piers are what we see today, where the steel of the new bridge meets the old concrete platforms. Some concern was voiced about whether the 44-year-old concrete would support the new bridge, so to make sure, International Maritime Divers Associates sent divers down to conduct a thorough inspection of the piers. 
How had they stood up to the ebb and flow of the salty waters of the York River for more than 40 years? Also, part of the inspection was a survey of the concrete pillars to check for settlement or tilting. Everyone was surprised and pleased with the results. Essentially, there had been no deterioration, settlement, or shifting. The old structure would hold the new bridge. The longevity of the piers is a testimonial to the superior engineering and construction techniques used to build these foundations. However, long before there was a bridge in place, the York River between Yorktown and Gloucester had been a crossing point. In fact, historians tell us that since the arrival of the first Native Americans 1,100 years ago, the site where the bridge now stands was a convenient crossing point. To the first English explorers, Gloucester Point quickly became a familiar landmark. Robert Tyndall, an English ship's captain who explored the York River in 1608, named the point after himself. So throughout the colonial period, it was called Tyndall's Point. In the 1600s, a tobacco warehouse was built near the river to store the cash crop that was the main source of Virginia's wealth. Here, hogsheads of tobacco were loaded aboard trade ships bound for England. By 1682, a ferry was carrying cargo and passengers across the river, and by about 1700, two towns had emerged on opposite sides of the crossing. To the east of Tyndall's Point was Gloucester Town. Directly across the river was Yorktown, the seat of government for York County and one of colonial Virginia's major tobacco ports. The late 1700s saw tobacco production declining, and as a result, commercial shipping in Yorktown began to taper off. But far more than being an early tobacco port, Yorktown made its biggest imprint on the history books as the site of the Revolutionary War battle that sealed America's victory for independence. In 1781, British Commander Lord Cornwallis was leading destructive forays against the Virginia countryside. In late summer of that year, his troops began building earthworks and forts at Yorktown and Gloucester Point as a base to continue his raid. Meanwhile, Generals George Washington and Jean Rochambeau were hurrying south to Virginia, leading a combined American and French army. While the American and French troops were advancing toward the area, the French fleet formed a naval blockade at the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay. This move kept the British Navy from helping Cornwallis, and all the while, the American and French forces were closing in on the British position. During the siege that followed, the Allied artillery continuously pounded away at the British positions. Meanwhile, Cornwallis ordered several ships scuttled in the York River in an effort to close off the passage between Yorktown and Gloucester Point. In a last desperate attempt to escape, the British planned to cross the river at night and make it unobserved to the Gloucester side. But that plan was foiled by a violent storm. Alerted to the British maneuver, Washington and Rochambeau trained their artillery on the York River crossing. The escape route had vanished, and so had Cornwallis's last hope. The war was effectively over. America had won its independence, and on October the 17th, 1781, the British surrendered. After the Revolution, Yorktown once again became a quiet, small river town on the banks of the York River. It was to be another 80 years before war would reach its shores again. The time in between would be peaceful and relatively unremarkable. In 1861, the southern states seceded from the Union, and war clouds again formed over Yorktown and Gloucester Point. That summer, Confederate troops began fortifying both sides of the river against a possible Union strike against Richmond. Gloucester Point was heavily fortified to prevent Union ships from moving up the river. It also became a military checkpoint. 
With more than 1,000 Confederate troops stationed there, ships moving up and down the river were closely monitored, and even local citizens needed a pass signed by the commander of the Confederate garrison to take the ferry across the river. War finally erupted in the area in the spring of 1862. Union General George McClellan's Army of the Potomac arrived on the peninsula and prepared to attack the Confederate works at Yorktown. From there, McClellan planned an assault on the Confederate capital of Richmond, 60 miles to the west. The Union troops began preparing for an elaborate siege. While they were mounting their heavy mortars at Yorktown, across the river at Gloucester Point, Confederate batteries were trading shots with northern ships. McClellan actually had the upper hand, but he didn't know it. He didn't know that his army vastly outnumbered the Confederates, who, far from planning for a siege, were just trying to delay McClellan's troops until the defenses around Richmond could be strengthened. In May of 1862, the Confederates suddenly withdrew to Richmond, and a surprise McClellan, who was prepared for a long siege, took both Yorktown and Gloucester Point without firing a shot. The Northern forces quickly turned Yorktown into a supply depot, and soon Union transport and gunships crowded the harbor. McClellan failed in his attempt to take Richmond. In fact, the war would rage another three years before the Confederate capital would fall. And while the war did continue elsewhere, there would be no further fighting in the vicinity of Yorktown and Gloucester Point, and the York River crossing remained firmly in Union control until the war's end. Recovery was slow, but once again, Yorktown and Gloucester Point had survived a war, and slowly, the familiar pattern of life on the York River began to return. Just two years after the war ended, the franchised Gloucester-Yorktown Ferry began operation. The boats usually tied up at Gloucester Point, if a passenger on the Yorktown side wanted to go across, he waved a flag to signal the ferryman to come and get him. Also, there were no landings. Passengers boarded and exited the ferry at whatever point was convenient. Life around the York River crossing remained, for the most part, quiet and serene. There was nothing much to get excited about on any grand scale until 1881. That year, Yorktown celebrated the centennial of the American and French victory over Lord Cornwallis. Mixed in with the locals attending the ceremonies were not only figures of a national prominence, but French dignitaries as well. A large flotilla of ships provided a dazzling display on the river that complemented the parades and celebrations on shore, with all of the festivities culminating in the dedication of the Yorktown Monument. Shortly after the 19th century gave way to the 20th, different modes of transportation were emerging and their numbers were increasing. In 1918, the ferry Cornwallis began plying the waters of the crossing and it was soon carrying automobiles. My daddy was worked on the first ferry that uh, used across the Elk River. That was the old ferry Cornwallis. He carried about 13 cars. I think he carried 13 cars at the most. And on a Sunday, you'd, the people would, a lot of the local people who had cars would cross the river to go over to Yorktown and just browse around and so forth. Cornwallis is around Cornwallis's cave in the Victor Monument. A lot of them had never been there before. And as the amount of traffic increased, so did the capacity of the ferry boats. Soon the fleet consisted of three boats, the York, the Gloucester, and the Virginia, which was the largest. Yeah, ran uh, every half hour. Left this side at quarter to and quarter after, another side even and a half, and ran until 12 o'clock at night. And 12 o'clock was the last, uh, when, I, when I first came there. The yeah, she carried about 38 cars, and the York would carry, say, uh, 24, and the Gloucester would carry 22. By the 1920s, it was becoming more apparent that a bridge was necessary at the crossing. The population was growing, automobile traffic was increasing, and the promise of economic development all seemed to indicate the necessity 
for a bridge. In fact, the first of many proposals for a bridge was drawn up in 1927, but the actual spanning of the river was still a quarter of a century away. To build a bridge at the crossing would present construction challenges, but the nuts and bolts operation of actually building a bridge were minor in comparison to the legal, policy, and paperwork problems that had to be surmounted. First, the state's pay-as-you-go requirement would not allow the project to be financed with bonds or tolls. Second, the naval weapon station just upriver meant that any bridge would have to have clearance enough for large Navy ships. A suspension bridge could be built high enough to provide this clearance, but that brought an environmental consideration into the mix. The National Park Service opposed building any bridge that could be seen from the Yorktown battlefield on the grounds that such a bridge would detract from the character and beauty of the Colonial National Park. The question became moot with the outbreak of World War II because all plans were shelved for the duration. So it was the late 1940s before a compromise was reached. The bridge would be a movable double swing span that would carry two lanes of traffic. Such a design would provide unlimited vertical clearance which satisfied the Navy's concerns and be low enough to minimize the visual impact on the Colonial National Park. And the pay-as-you-go issue finally made its way to the Virginia State Supreme Court, which gave the go-ahead for a bond issue to pay for the construction. With all of the preliminaries taken care of, work on the caissons and piers finally got underway in the late 1940s. The construction was a tedious task, and the contractors fell behind schedule. Roger Stevenson, Parsons Brinkerhoff's resident engineer on the job, didn't want the project to be delayed, so he started looking for ways to speed up the construction. So one day my assistant and I got to thinking, what are we going to do? We're supposed to have this thing open in May of 1952, and here's, here's Virginia Bridge over here. They're going to get stymied. And finally one day we're trying to convince him you ought to wreck these things on barges, railroad barges. Finally one day he says, I had enough of this with you two guys. I'm going to get our chief engineer down, which he did. And uh, this, this, this fellow was a brilliant fellow, too. He listened to, uh, to Joe and I expound on erecting <laughs> on a barge. And finally turned around to Johnny Penner. He says, you go hunt up a, a, these railroad barges. He said, this is not a stupid idea. He said, this can be done. So after having convinced the contractor to try this radical idea, crews of the Virginia Bridge Company started building the Coleman Bridges steelwork on barges in the York River adjacent to where they would be installed. Once finished, the steelwork was floated over the piers in the river and lowered into place by pumping sand out of the barges. And then we let the sand jacks pay sand out, and that whole truss came down and just sat right on a rock as neat as you'd ever want to see. If the operation he described sounds familiar, it should. Actually, there were a few differences between the installation of the original bridge and the span in service today. First, the old spans weren't nearly as heavy, and they didn't have to be moved as far as the new bridge sections. Also, it was months, not days, before the roadway was built, and the span was open to traffic. But there's no denying that it was an ingenious and gutsy move to use the float-in method a method that up to this time had been used very few times. It was May the 7th, 1952, when the bridge was open to traffic. More than 10,000 people lined the waterfront to watch the dedication ceremony and to be among the first to make that inaugural journey across the new bridge. For many years thereafter, the Coleman Bridge handled its traffic with great efficiency. But by 1983, as the structure was beginning its fourth decade of operation, it became apparent that the two-lane facility was becoming inadequate. VDOT and local officials began exploring ways to remedy the situation. And after a full decade of debate on the issue, it was decided that instead of a new crossing further upriver, the existing bridge should be replaced. 
With the issue of what was to be done where finally settled, the decision was made to try and do it in a way that kept traffic disruption to a minimum by choosing the novel method of construction that we've described for you earlier. But even though the float in of the spans took only nine days, there was still a lot of work to do before the bridge could be opened to its full capacity of four lanes. The new swing span system had to be tested and adjusted. The old center approach lanes had to be demolished. And the new approach roadway had to be completed. In addition, the facilities for the electronic toll collection system had to be installed. With all these things completed, finally on August 2nd, 1996, everything was ready. Governor George Allen had the pleasant task of dedicating the new bridge. So what we're here in making history about is, we're, is listening to the people. The people said that old span needed a new lifespan. And that's exactly what we're dedicating today with the new George P. Coleman Bridge. As the tide of the York River ebbed and flowed over the years, there's an awful lot of history that took place on its banks. And now, part of that history includes the bridge that carried traffic across its waters for more than four decades, and the new span that replaced it. Two bridges, each of which brought distinguished recognition to the engineers and designers who set new standards for building bridges. Dedicated individuals who challenged the conventional wisdom by asking, what if we could do this in a different and better way? And they did. 